so now we're going to hear from Dr. Carolyn Sitcher, who's going to talk about secondary trauma, burnout, and self-care. <laughs> so why don't we just talk about clinical services? We're here to talk about how to support the supporters. Well, it's all the same thing. And I saw a lot of people nodding, in part because this is familiar from your clinical experiences, but also in part because it all applies to us. And I'm a trauma specialist, and I think probably everybody in the room has had some experience working with people who have experienced trauma, if not yourselves. And what does that mean? Well, trauma is an unanticipated, overwhelming experience. We all have that every day, especially in New York City. And when you meet with your clients and your tenants and you hear their stories, it is often unanticipated and overwhelming. So how do we take care of ourselves and why does that matter? Well, if we hear these stories enough and we don't feel like we're cared for enough, we burn out. And program directors don't want us to burn out. Funders don't want us to burn out because it's expensive to retrain us and it's expensive to have to start all over again and it's expensive not just financially but also with time and emotion to have everybody start from scratch. And it's bad for the tenants too. Nobody wants to have a new provider, as you were talking about. They've seen a lot of rotating doors and people. So we don't want to be that. So how do we prevent that from happening? Well, we have, what, an hour left, so we can't really solve all that. But one of the things that I do with my patients is talk a lot about how to take care of yourselves after upsetting things have happened. And we talk about how to manage and metabolize information that comes at us. And it's the same thing for all of us. It's not just my patients who have had terrible traumatic experiences, but it's any one of us who have had a bad day, an overwhelming client. And we're, you were talking about parenting. And a lot of times, so one of the other things I did through supportive housing or CSH was working with the providers. And I sort of shifted from working with the young adults as my patients to working with the providers of young adult, for young adult supportive housing, thinking about how to support them better. And what did we do? We spent a lot of time talking about their cases. And most programs say they have clinical supervision on site. That's part of whether weekly meetings with their supervisors. And if you ask most case managers, they say we never get clinical supervision. And I thought, well, this is funny. So I started kind of investigating, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm a clinician. I am, that is my job, that is my training, that is my love, I love doing it. And I am not, I've been an administrator because that's sort of what happens sometimes, but I'm really a clinician. And a lot of the supervisors and um, directors were not. They were administrators and terrific directors. but there was a real language barrier, it seemed like. And so I ended up, like what I do when I'm working with adolescents, I felt like I was an interpreter. And I was helping think out what are the case managers and the frontline staff missing from their day-to-day -day support? Because the best way to mitigate a trauma is to have a sense of social support. And social support is friends, social support is colleagues, social support is your community, and even the people they're working with. So if you're not feeling very supported at work, you're not, pretty, you're not that psyched about going to work. And all the stress and the burden that you're dealing with every day is coming at you and you're not able to really manage it very well. And then your personal life suffers. And then you go home and you think, God, I'm not doing anything well now. I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good partner. I'm not a good uh, case manager. I'm not a good director. And then you start to feel terrible. And then you're like, oh, everything's got to change. So we want to prevent that. Um, so thinking about clinical supervision was one of the big, my kind of wish, and I kept sort of beating everybody up with over the head about let's have clinical supervision on staff, and everybody said, we have it, we have it, and I said, no, you don't have it. Let's talk about the clinical cases. Well, these aren't our therapy patients, I would hear, but it's all the same. You know, what I'm doing, granted, I have a doctorate in clinical psychology, but it's not rocket science. What it is is being able to sit down and listen and ask really hard questions and then know what to do with that information. And that information was, you know, I was in 35 foster placements and my two-year-old child just got taken away from me and now my child's in foster care and I'm miserable and I'm mad and I have, I had a 21-year-old say to me, I have anger management problems, I have anger problems. I thought, no you don't, you have a lot to be angry about. Why? That's not a problem. We have to help you figure out what to do about this and how to fix the situation. 
And, you know, she was rightfully pretty despondent and thinking, there is no hope for this. You know, my kid's going to go through the same system I did. You know, it's very nice that supportive housing exists, but nobody really cares about me. And, you know, a year later, I was really happy to say she got her kid back out of foster care, and she felt very supported by a lot of people. But that was in part because her case manager started asking the hard questions about, tell me about your life. You know, everybody gets the, the case files. And this is who this, pers sorry, this person was before they came to see me. And you kind of read through it and you think, gosh, this is so terrible, but I know this person now and so I'm going to sit down. And now my director says I have to do all these different things and meet all these goals. And I have too much to do, so I'm going to do the best I can with what I have to do. Well, the problem is then talking about engagement, it's really hard to engage somebody. And I kept hearing over and over again, how do you motivate these tenants, especially the young adults and the adolescents? How do you motivate them? Well, when I was an adolescent, I really liked the grown-ups that sat down and listened to me and asked me a question about me. You know, tell me about yourself. What do you mean? Well, what do you like to do? Where'd you come from? Who are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. And often the, the case managers would say to me, we don't have time for that. I said, you don't have time not to do that. And then the next question was, what if I hear things that I don't know what to do with? Well, that's where, again, the clinical supervision and the support comes in, because we need to figure out what do you do with the information that feels very overwhelming. And you don't have to solve the problems, because I think we're also fixers. Like, all of us feel like we have to make this better. And we can't make this better. And sort of reminding ourselves what our real job is and what our obligation is, which is not to make our tenants' lives better, per se, but to help them take care of themselves better so that they do make a better life. And some of that is figuring out what are the resources in the community and in the supportive housing systems that are helpful, but a lot of that is you feeling, get, getting permission to be able to say, who are you? Tell me about yourself. What is important to you? What motivates you? What do, what do you care about? You know, you're talking about with adolescents or with families, you know, everybody getting on the same page about who cares about what. Well, it's the same thing when you're working with your tenants. If, you know, you have a set of directives, I have to get you employed, educated, paying rent, healthy, not substance abusing, and probably many more things on that list. And they may or may not really care about that. So how do you get them to care? Do they, should they care? Why should they care? And thinking out sort of how do we, how do we manage all the things that we have to do? You know, everybody has too many cases. And that was the other thing I was always saying to directors, like, you've got to cut down the caseload. And they were kind of laughing at me. Yeah, yeah, OK, get out of here. And you know, it is true. There's, just, there's no way around this that you all carry too big a burden just in terms of being able to answer every phone call. But, sort of going back to the initial point, which is around secondary trauma and why, why we burn out so quickly. Well, we carry their traumas, their histories, their burdens, their fears, their worries every single day. And we come in at 9 or 8 or 7, and we leave at 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night. But we all have cell phones. We all have email. We all have text messages that come in all day and all night. And Flexibility is really important, and I think it's underappreciated. You know, I, one of the things that I'm really grateful for is the ability to have a flexible schedule so that I can see my patients when I need to see my patients, but nobody's saying punch in at this time, punch out at that time, because my work doesn't stop when I punch out. When I leave the office, I'm still getting patient emails, text messages. I'm still getting, you know, other work emails, text messages, phone calls. But nobody's saying, you're still working. That's, that's your time. Well, I'm not getting paid for that. You know, it's a very complicated system now where we're expected to just be on call all the time. And it doesn't feel very good. And so thinking about how does our work environment support us, well, ideally, one of the things that happens is we really consider flexibility and flexibility of time. And you know, we're all adults, presumably, or close to it. And, we all should be treated as such. And so that means we should be allowed to decide within reason. You have to meet your goals, obviously. You have to, you know, I have to see X number of patients to make my paycheck every week. Well, okay, stop doing that. <laughs> um, but I don't have to do it between these hours. I have to do it between the hours that a patient can see me. Well, you guys have these tenants that 
are trying to have jobs, they're trying to go to school, they're trying to get medical care, they're trying to get mental health services, all of those things happen between 9 and 5. And so you're also supposed to find your tenants between 9 and 5. Well, they're out. And so then you're stuck saying, well, I couldn't find them, I couldn't make contact, so I'll try next week. And now you're playing catch up all the time. And so the idea of having some kind of flexibility seems like a really important piece to trying to feel supported, that your program is listening to what your needs are. And, um, yeah. So, let's see. There are also basic self-care issues, right? How do we take care of ourselves? At work, at home, in between work and home, you know, can you exercise? Can you have lunch or dinner with a friend? Can you see your child? Can you see your partner? Can you have time by yourself? Can you sleep a little later? Are you sleeping at all? And all of this is part of the job, right? Like if you're not able to do these basic self-care issues, then you're not able to do a good job. And thinking about how do you, how does a, a program support your self-care? Because self-care goes right out the window the minute you feel burdened and stressed and overwhelmed. You're not sleeping, you're eating terribly, you're not exercising because you don't have time, you're probably snapping at everybody around you, work and home, and now you feel terrible again. And again, you're back to burning out. So trying to figure out how to take care of yourselves and how to make sure that your, your work environment is supporting that, including having some casual meetings with your peers and your colleagues. That doesn't have to be another meeting that we all have to go to, but a time where you can kind of hang, if you will, in a you know, productive way. And it doesn't have to be you've got an agenda, but you have a time to kind of vent. You and I, Mary, were driving to a meeting once, and I remember you saying you read in, I think, like Women's Health magazine that there was a two minutes, everybody needed two minutes a day to just vent. And we were stuck in terrible traffic, and we were going from like Manhattan to one part of Brooklyn to like a way another part of Brooklyn, and it was just like, and we had another colleague in the car, and so we all decided to try it. And two minutes is very long, as it turns out. It's a really long time to vent, and it's a really long time to listen, but it sure felt great. And at the end of it, we were all like rolling in laughter, and the day went much better in the traffic. Mary is very zen about traffic, I can't understand it, but the traffic, was less bothersome to all the rest of us. And I, I think that there are a lot of self-care pieces that we forget. Breathing. You know, I don't know how many of us forget to breathe. I certainly do. And I find myself like, wow, did I just breathe in the last minute? And, you know, I'm not passing out, but I sure am having short, shallow breaths that are not filling my body. So one of the things that I did a lot when I was working with programs was breathing. You know, I'm not trying to be all sort of yogic. I'm not a great yogi, but... I really think that breathing, when I'm working with trauma victims too, learning how to take a deep, meaningful breath, it calms everything down, it slows everything down, it means that you are able to function better, you have more energy and more blood flow and more oxygen in your body to do better. Uh, you know, I taught a lot of, um, okay, I work with kids, so what I called the wet noodle, but it was progressive muscle relaxation, so they're trying to teach, remind us, it's not teaching, reminding us how to relax our bodies in any moment. You don't have to lie down and have a couch or a bed to lie down and do this. It would be nice, but we don't all have that in our offices. But thinking of how do you do that while you're sitting in a chair right now and sort of tensing up every part of your body one at a time and then letting go. Again, it helps you relax. It helps get you through those moments where you are feeling irritable and at your end and feeling like, I can't do this for five more minutes. There are a lot of different really simple techniques like that that if I had my way, we would all be reminded of monthly at work because it's very easy to forget, especially as life gets busy and sort of time runs away with us. And thinking out, again, the sort of the two things that probably matter most in our, all of our work is figuring out how to have really good clinical supervision and clinical meaning an opportunity to really talk about the nitty gritty of your cases. What are the challenges? Not what are the administrative issues? Not what's the paperwork look like? Not, you know, how do I get them from A to B? Though that is sometimes the challenge, right? I can't get them to go to the doctor and they are having serious medical issues. Well, they don't want to go to the doctor because they're afraid of what else they're going to find. Talking out with a supervisor about what's really the obstacles for this person and what is it stirring up in you? 
so that you can kind of get past your stuff to help your clients, your tenants, your patients get to the appointment they need to get to. So support and supervision in that way, and then self-care. Those are sort of the two key pieces in my mind to thinking out how do we support ourselves better so we're able to do better.